Good afternoon, and welcome to our webcast today with Dr. Melanie Barwick, who will discuss issues related to KT planning, implementation, and measuring outcomes. I'm your host, Joanne Starks, from the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or KTDRR, a project of American Institutes for Research based in Austin, Texas. We are funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, known as NIDLR. This will be a live interactive webcast that serves as a follow-up to Dr. Barwick's KT conference presentation last Friday, November 3rd. Today, she'll talk with several NIDLR grantees about their experiences using the KT planning template to help plan their KT activities and how this tool can be used to guide implementation and evaluation. The representatives of NIDLR projects who have volunteered to discuss KT planning this afternoon include Wendy strobel Goer from Cornell University, Mary Slavin of Boston University, and Margaret Peg Nosek from Baylor College of Medicine. First, I'll go over some elements of the Adobe Connect environment. And as a reminder, we are recording this session and we'll have the archive available in a few weeks. If you prefer not to be identified in the recording, you can skip identifying yourself now and if you ask any questions in the chat box. You'll listen to the webcast over your computer speakers, and to adjust the volume, you can do that on your own computer. There's also a green speaker icon in the bar at the very top of your screen, and you can adjust the volume there. In the center of the screen is the main area where the presentation slides will be shared. At the top left window, you'll see a picture of Dr. Barwick. Below that is the chat box, and I'd like to invite everyone to please introduce yourselves there. This is also the best way to communicate with us. If you have any questions, just ask in the chat box, and one of the KTDR team members will respond. You can also call our toll-free number, 800-266-1832, if you have technical issues. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Melanie Barwick. We are privileged to have worked with Melanie over a number of years. She has conducted several webcasts and has presented at our online KT conferences. Today, she will give a very brief overview of KT planning, and most of our time will be a conversation with NIDLR grantees about their KT planning experiences. Dr. Barwick is a senior scientist in the Child Evaluative Sciences Program of the Research Institute and head of the Child and Youth Mental Health Research Unit in the Department of Psychiatry at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, known as Sick Kids. At the University of Toronto, she's an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and in the Dalai Lana School of Public Health. Melanie is an internationally recognized expert in implementation science and knowledge translation and has a program of research that spans health, mental health, education, and global health sectors. Her research aims to improve the implementation of evidence into practice and to broaden the reach of evidence more generally to support decision making, policy, knowledge, and awareness. Melanie, are you ready to begin? I am. Thank you, Joanne, <clears throat> for that lovely introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, nice to chat with folks again today. <clears throat> I'm going to just take you through a very brief um, context uh, landscape of KT planning. And then, as Joanne mentioned, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really nice privilege to have um, the three investigators joining us today to talk about their own KT plans uh, using the uh, framework provided by the KT planning template and provide us with an opportunity to see what that application looks like. So for those of you who need to get from sort of the abstract idea of KT planning to what this concretely um, looks like in your field, this will be a good exercise, I think. And um, we'll have an opportunity to comment on certain aspects of the KT plans presented from, um, from the perspective of an evaluation rubric that we're working on here in our KT program at SickKids. So um, moving right along, uh, I think most of the people uh, were on, who are on the call now were on the call on Friday, so I don't want to be too repetitive. I'd rather leave more time to hear from our three investigators. But essentially, we're talking about the, um, the importance of getting from an idea uh, and maybe not even having an idea about how we would translate our research findings, uh, both whilst we're doing our research and at the conclusion of our research, 
the importance of really um, planning for that and and uh, taking that to action. And so the planning template really allows you to um, be very mindful about the knowledge translation opportunities you may have for your research project and to give you a schema or a framework with which to organize your KT work. Um, we always start with thinking about what the knowledge translation or the research communication goals are uh, for uh, the knowledge translation that we want to do. And this is, this is really sort of the crux of a good KT plan. Um, you'll often hear said that for a really good research study, you need to start with a really bang on research question. And from that, you can build a good rigorous methodology and make a contribution to science. So in much the same way, the KT goal uh, is equivalent to a really good research question. And what you need to be thinking about is, why am I communicating this research evidence to this particular audience? What is my hope? Um, what am I hoping to accomplish? How do, I, how do I desire this knowledge user audience to benefit from the communication of my research evidence? And as you can see on this slide, there are a range of KT goals. We typically like to think about ones that have to do with behavior change and practice change and policy change because that's oftentimes our uh, postcard destination, you know, the continuum of research is really trying to have an impact on the health and well-being of, uh, of our population. But not every research study is poised to have this sort of instrumental uh, benefit or um, instrumental use of the research evidence that we produce. Uh, sometimes uh, the best that we can hope for is to generate interest or awareness in what we've learned and to share a certain body of knowledge, keeping in mind the ethical and the scientific limitations around that body of knowledge. Uh, we certainly strive to inform research and we have, um, you know, well tried and true pathways for doing that through our academic publications, our peer review, our conferences and so on. And many of us like to also have an impact in informing decision making in the community. And so this is oftentimes a KT goal as well. And you may actually have multiple KT goals for one knowledge user audience. You may also have different KT goals for different KT audiences or knowledge user audiences. So we'll get to see what that looks like for some of the projects um, that we're going to hear about today in a moment. So one of the things I look for, um, both in the teaching of KT planning and also when I listen to people's KT plans as they develop or if I'm evaluating it as part of a, um, a research application, um, is alignment of the core elements of good KT planning. Typically what we see are, you know, a KT plan that, that's very, very good at identifying who you're involving. Um, in terms of who are your knowledge users or your target audiences that you're reaching out to. And then we tend to see a following paragraph about how you're going to do that and the strategy. And the problem with that is there's no alignment. Uh, first of all, we reaching out to a group of people with a main message without an idea of what you hope uh, to accomplish or how you hope they will benefit from that main message is a little haphazard. Um, and if you have a benefit and a main message and a targeted communication in mind, that then flows to some knowledge translation strategies that map onto that KT goal and then consequently how you might evaluate whether that KT goal was accomplished. And so we're looking at more of a, a, a set of steps. So, you know, what did you learn? Who needs to know? Those are your knowledge user audiences and you can identify several of them. It's typically not a good idea to go too big in terms of too many groups that require specific tailored messaging and strategies. And it's going to depend a lot on the feasibility of who's on your team, how well are you resourced to accomplish those KT activities. So that's one of the things I look for when I assess feasibility. 
you refine your main messages um, with that particular knowledge user group in mind. What is it we want to tell community members about what we learned? What is it that's important to tell decision makers or policy makers, et cetera? And being very clear on the KT goal, how do you want them to benefit from the telling? Uh, is this an awareness building, interest building, shifting attitudes, building knowledge base? What is the, the KT goal? How are you going to accomplish that? So what strategies will you use? And then how will you know if you were successful? <clears throat> So there are different evaluation approaches. This is certainly not the only way to evaluate your knowledge translation activities. Uh, on Friday, I talked about the use of indicators and gave you um, sort of a bit of a, a flyover of a resource that I frequently use that looks at reach, usefulness, use, and collaboration indicators. But there are different approaches to evaluation, and some of them are listed here on the slide. They are, uh, they could certainly be, um, complementary. You wouldn't necessarily have to pick one over the other. This is the resource that I talked about. So if you weren't on the call on Friday or you've not explored it, I highly recommend it. And I'm um, going to skip over this piece just to give you an idea. Uh, in summary, reach indicators are things that correspond to whether your material and your, your knowledge translation communication reached the people you wanted it to reach and how. Um, how useful was it? Did they use it? Do they intend to use it? Do they want to adapt it? Um, does it inform policy, et cetera? Um, has it built collaboration or capacity if that is indeed one of your aims in reaching out with your research evidence? How might you look at that? And we talked about the partnership evaluation tool as just one amongst many partnership tools that allow you to assess what happens as a result of collaborative work. And so that takes us to the knowledge translation planning template. Um, and uh, let me just see here. So um, what I thought we would do is um, have Wendy um, uh, give us a, you know, a couple of um, sentences about what her project is about, what's the research question. Um, and then sure. um, I'm not entirely sure, Wendy, whether this is a proposal or whether this is an end of grant KT planning exercise where the research has already been conducted, but you can elucidate. And then maybe, Wendy, you could take us sure. through um, it. Sure. So, so were speaking I loud, decided to um, do so like this a a exercise around the um, as we work Northeast the ADA uh, research KT. planning so efforts. I'm the ADA centers now, provide training and technical assistance to people who have rights or responsibilities under the ADA. The purpose of our research effort was to identify region-specific barriers, facilitators, and best practices for implementing Title I of the ADA in small private and public sector organizations in order to identify a package of innovative approaches that mitigate barriers to ADA compliance and support these organizations in leveraging disability inclusive employment practices across our region, which is New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. Um, and we're doing the work around this in a couple of different ways. One through um, intensive consulting, which we call uh, customized service agreements, and through our research and parallel efforts. Um, so our project partners for this are primarily private sector and industry. Um, and we have been working with our partners. Um, we wrote the initial idea ourselves, um, but after idea formation and straight through the project, we will be engaging with small employers in a number of different ways. Um, as I mentioned, some are uh, participating in key informant interviews. Others are actually working in partnerships with us to um, achieve goals around ADA implementation. So it's kind of a multi-pronged study. We're also doing a lot of um, literature review and stuff like that to inform the process. Um, our partners are primarily key informants, um, and they are our implementation partners as well. Um, we are relying primarily on expertise within the team around KT that we've developed over the years. We do a lot of knowledge translation. Um, 
again, our knowledge users are primarily private sector and industry. Um, they're HR departments, the people who actually uh, write and implement policy um, within an organization. Um, as I mentioned, when I started, we are really looking at, at finding out what works and what doesn't work. Where are small employers struggling with ADA implementation? How much policy um, do they have in place? How much process supports that policy? Um, what helps with implementation? Uh, what kind of support do they need? Um, our goal is to develop tools that they can use after we do all this work that we can kind of generalize to other employers even if we're not working intensively with them anymore. Um, sure, am I being confusing? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Wendy, can I just stop you for a sec, Wendy? Um, not at all, no, no, no. I just, um, just wanna kind of uh, comment on a few things on this page of the template before we move on to the next one and then you can continue. It's great. Um, it's very clear to me. Um, so just thinking about project partners for a moment, I think you've been very clear in identifying that um, the, the private sector and industry are the folks that will benefit in the sense of what you learn and how they might, um, what strategies they might use to mitigate those barriers. Uh, I wonder, though, whether you have an obligation to communicate the findings of your research with other um, audiences or project, and they might not be project partners, so that might come up on the next page, which is um, the oh, knowledge yeah. users. Um, so yeah, let me you definitely click care. That page here, and I just wonder <laughs> um, well, whether well, so there's your a research funder the research is funders for sure. Nidler is very interested, but also we have a network of ADA project. centers. There's ten yeah. of us around the country, Anybody as else? well as we have our own KT center, yeah. um, who are also be people who care about this. Um, so, uh, and you know, I don't know how much spillover there will be into other people. Uh, who care about Title I who aren't small employers, because good practice is good practice. Um, but certainly our funding agency and our peers care a great deal about this information. Um, I, I suppose we will. Sure. And then <laughs> That's a lower priority. You'll write Honestly, it's a You'll lower priority for, of your for our team. I think we'll publish an article at the end of it because that's what we do as Maybe. an academic institution. Um, but the work of the ADA centers, a lot yeah. of it happens at the community level. Um, so the majority of our focus will be on developing um, usable tools that other small businesses can use. Um, but hopefully we will also identify generalizable lessons um, that can impact employment for people with disabilities in a, in a larger segment. So maybe you could um, go to the next one. Sure. So for small employers, it's how do we implement the ADA uh, in a way program. that or, a or reduces our risk Can you think for about how they might um, be a little different for charges being filed against us. That's an easy one for small employers. For our funding agency, it's um, I think they care more about is the work that we're doing impactful in the stakeholder community that that we're working with. Um, and for our peer organizations, it's what can we use in our own regions based on the work that you did here. <laughs> I don't know if that's good at all. Um, but those are the kinds of, of, of things that we're primarily focused on. I think our methodology and how we're coming to this information will certainly be um, interesting and relevant to researchers. Um, when we're ready to share that, once we know that, that we got good information, then it's helpful. Okay, so 
thinking about the knowledge translation goals here, um, sure. Can you create so, as you talk uh, some across, alignment between? Uh, okay, I'm thinking about okay, this audience, I, this main. Message, Melanie, I'm I'm this, I will admit to uh, having KT difficulty goals. with how I filled out the form, and now what you're asking me. I hope I'm answering this correctly. Um, but our main goals for the audience uh, in, is to develop awareness and interest across a number of audiences. I think people with disabilities care a lot about how small employers are implementing Title I of the ADA and how they can seek support. Um, but really what we're looking to do with the small employers themselves is practice change, behavior change for their managers. We're looking to have them create and implement policy um, to employees with disabilities within these organizations. We want them to be armed with knowledge about what their rights are and how to approach a policy that's been implemented. And we want to ensure that the organizations have the tools that allow them to access um, their rights uh, for reasonable accommodation. Um, I think it will definitely in inform um, the, the research community when we publish our, um, our approach to this work, you know, when we're ready to do that. Um, but really, we are looking at um, policy and practice change within the employer organizations. Okay. So in in that um, in that context, I think it's important for me to reiterate that this is a knowledge translation planning template, which is how do we get the knowledge out to the people who need to access it in a way that's understandable. Um, and the KT strategies that you're going to talk about are the right. strategies you use. Yeah, I am. That, but it's it's, it's different. I don't know how much they vary though, develop to tell you the to truth. Because the honestly, we're doing a lot of interactive small group work with employers, and we are talk to them about before? barriers and carriers. But at that time, and we also ask them, what information do you need to make this change, and how can we tell you this in a way that's meaningful? So we're it's it's a for us it's not necessarily a separate process. It's more of we get the information about barriers and carriers, but we also get the information about what they need to know and how do they need to know it and how do they want us to tell them or support them to do that. Yes. So that's really important information because you're collecting information which maps onto your research question, if you will. You know, what are the barriers and facilitators um, for the ADA? And you're also collecting information about the preferences, the communication preferences of your knowledge users. So those are two things going on as you proceed with the data collection part uh, and the exploration of the research issue. Um, so now when you think about what your goals are, which are to develop awareness that and interest in a way that prepares the stage to then go on and develop a practice change plan or an implementation plan, which is outside of this template, um, once you have an idea of you know, what did you learn about barriers? What facilitators do you think would be useful for people to know about? And how might you support them to engage in those? What strategies? Yeah, and, and what we're trying to do right now is, is form partnerships to, with say, um, um, the places where or, small you know, employers congregate. Uh, so the National Federation of businesses. Independent Business, Chambers of Commerce. Um, on, uh, we are kind of revamping our website. So instead of being a portal to the project, it's a portal to information that uh, is, is allow, allows people to easily access the answers they need. Um, and that information will also be put into this portal so that small businesses who are looking to do this implementation work can easily access it. Um, we will likely also do conferences for those uh, congregate organizations. Um, we will uh, engage champions and we will create educational materials 
um, outside of the web uh, for dissemination through those congregate organizations. Um, and then flipping to the next page, let's just talk a little bit about evaluation. So the purpose, presumably, of putting information on the website is uh, to reach out to a lot of people, uh, to present. Um, well, I think you know, we're going to do a couple of different things. We always track metrics ADA and issues, what are people accessing, how long are they staying on it, do they how go to you one know thing that the website they stay for a while. So we'll track that, those kinds of use indicators. Um, we're also going to look at partnership and collaboration indicators. One of the things we found as we work with employers is if we are helpful, they call us and ask for more help, <laughs> right? Um, and they also tell each other about us. Um, so that has been a, a really good way to tell if, um, if we're impactful. Even since we started the outreach work, um, it, for the longest time, uh, facility access has been our primary TA contact information. But since we started doing this work in the last year, employment has overtaken that, um, which I find to be just a good anecdotal um, piece of evidence that building a reputation in an area results in more partnerships. We're going to look at practice change indicators uh, with employers. We are doing a survey um, now to find out what people do. I think it would be very interesting at the end of the project to do a similar survey um, to see if that those numbers have changed about who has a policy, who has a practice, those kinds of things. Um, and we'll also look at our own outcome data and documentation, the program or service indicators that are that are on the list. Yeah, I, th I think we're done, right? Excuse me, this is Joanne. I just wanted to let you know there's only a couple minutes before we need to move on for Mary. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so there's some things you can track in terms of growth in, in collaboration, uh, growth in number of partnerships, number of people who contact you for information, both online and through other modalities. Yeah, um, we have a whole... So sometimes evaluation <laughs> for these kinds of metrics is simply about keeping track and, and um, logging sort of activities that happen as a result. Um, and so it sounds like... Right. So that's, that's really important in terms of evaluation, and you need to sort of outline that for each of your, your strategies. So, yep. you know, educational yep. materials are um, intending to do what for whom, and um, how will you know that your educational materials met that target? Right? And the same with champions. Champions are a great strategy that are uh, I, oftentimes interwoven with other strategies. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and how, we've, how we've you know actually considered a lot of that, and, and for the, a lot of our champions, it's, it's, of are they willing to speak right? on our behalf so with us at conferences? Are they willing to, to send information to their membership? Do does their do their conversations lead people back to us for additional assistance? Um, so those are our primary indicators around those champions. Um, I think it confirmed that uh, the research, oh, we knew the research so that we were doing was sound, like? and we knew that the, the, um, the support we were providing in terms of the customized service agreements template? was sound. And it just helped us to think about, um, are we then going to get what we need for the, for the information out portion um, as we were planning to get the information in? Right, okay. Great. Well, thanks, thanks a lot um, for sharing your work, Wendy. Um, really uh, interesting for me to see sort of what your thinking is, and I wish you the best of luck on that project.
Uh, next up, we have Mary. So I'd like to invite Mary to go through the similar process, maybe hum a few bars about what your project is, uh, and then we'll go through the template. Mary? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, just let me know if you have any difficulty hearing me. Um, my name is Mary Slavin, and I'm at Washington University. And I've been working with our group on a project uh, called the Libre Profile. It's the Life Impact Burn Recovery Evaluation Assessment Tool. And we are funded by NIDLER to, uh, for this project. And it started off as a uh, concern about some of the um, sort of social participation problems that people have with burn injury. And it's uh, very much a concern of clinicians due to the fact that people with burn injury are surviving physically and you know, even with more extensive burn injuries. But um, the, in, the, the kinds of services that are provided are really aimed at uh, physical restoration with very little attention to the uh, devastating uh, social impact that these burn injuries have. So it was widely acknowledged within the field that this was a missing ingredient and one of the best ways to get a handle on um, what social participation issues were was to develop a measure and assessment tool. And with that, we have a approach that we've used for other rehab outcome measures that uses a sophisticated computerized adaptive test. We develop item, item banks of different domains of interest, and then these items are delivered using a computer program to select items that are best matched to each individual. And in that way, uh, no matter where the person is along a, a distribution of a quality of, or a trait, uh, they can, the items that are administered to them will match where they are, whether they have a high level of social, social participation or a very low level of social participation. The computer will find the right items for them based on their answers to previous uh, questions and deliver a, a set of items that are perfectly tailored to that individual. So you can see that um, right away this project requires uh, you know, very much strong involvement from the burn injury community. And we're very fortunate when we go to this project partners. You know, certainly we have a solid research team who has worked in burn injury as well as on computerized adaptive tests. We're engaged with researchers at Spalding Rehab in Mass General as well as our, our group at Boston University. For consumers, we partnered with the Phoenix Society, which is a consumer organization for persons with burn injury. And they're very interested in having this sort of assessment available and integrating it into the services that they provide to consumers. So it was just a very natural um, evolution of the KT plan because so many of the partners were already so invested. In terms of the public, you know, I do think um, that this will seep out into the public, but the public is not our primary project partner. But uh, one of the concerns that people with burn injury have is a lot of their social participation limitations are due to the reaction the public has to them. Uh, in terms of decision makers, I don't see us being involved with decision makers yet. But m longer term, when we have data on social participation, I think we might be able to make a case for um, providing funding for services, et cetera. Uh, private sector industry, um, no, no uh, partnership there. Research funding bodies, certainly we're affiliated with NIDLER. Uh, and nothing uh, practitioners. Uh, we have a clinical advisory board uh, that was assembled to bring you know, key opinion uh, leaders into the project so that we would ultimately have um, input from the other group of potential end users, which will be clinicians. Um, any questions on that? No, it's really project. comprehensive. It makes a lot of sense. Any questions from anyone? Okay. Do you want to walk us through, um, just very briefly, we'll touch on the other uh, aspects of the plan. So yeah. presumably, a lot of the people on your project team were involved right at the beginning. Yes. Yeah, so people have been involved from the beginning. But we're at a point now where this, this activity is coming at a good time for us because our project is winding down. And we want to consider how to 
keep this going beyond the project, so the sustainability issue. And, you know, as, as we get to the end of this um, template, I think we will talk about some of the ways that we're trying to get this tool embedded in use before our project ends. And that's really the focus of our concern right now in terms of the knowledge translation is to get the embedding piece so that it, it is used. In terms of our partner roles, um, you know, they've been tremendous partners in um, assisting in this throughout the process. And right now, we just had a meeting yesterday to talk about implementation. And as I was mentioning, you know, it, it all sounds easy when you get to the point we have a, a wonderful tool to be used, but how do you get this piece of technology embedded in different systems, and how do you provide access to the technology? So we're having a series of implementation meetings. We're going to start with the Phoenix Society, who we anticipate will be the primary distributor of this computerized adaptive test. And you know, the computerized adaptive test can be administered as a web-based version, which you know there are issues about embedding the program on a website and getting data collection um, databases and how to use the data. And then uh, we also have a desktop version, so we're trying to determine how to strategize about getting those two different versions available, how to make them accessible to people who want to use this. And we actually have quite a few um, groups who are interested in partnering with us. So we thought we might start with the Phoenix Society as the, the mega end user and see what their needs are in terms of integrating this program into their website. Our goal is to get the training materials embedded with the program into the website so that everything is available in a one-stop shopping. Um, but I, we, we anticipate that there will be technological issues as well as refinement of our training materials to make sure they're clear. So we hope to um, engage other partners. And, and this will come up again as in another section where we're having a sort of a stage stepwise approach to this implementation. Right. In terms so of the, keeping, the, in mind, keeping in mind that this is just the knowledge translation, can people access it? Can they understand it? Can you start the first phase of implementation, which is creating buy-in and awareness and interest yeah. and knowledge? Right? And then you'd need to move to a set of po uh, processes and strategies that support implementation that would come from mm -hmm. uh, implementation science. Yep. And, you know, I do think so, the, the great fortune of having some of the you know, leaders in, in burn injury involved in our project uh, did help to get that buy-in. So, you know, we find people sort of chomping at the bit to get this. They want it. And our biggest problem is going to be how to overcome some of the technological barriers to making it accessible, not from, from the standpoint of how do you get this technology embedded into a system where they can access the computer program and, and know how to store data and use data. It's, it's a lot more complicated than it appears at the beginning, and we're deeply into that right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you think of any um, audiences you might target that are not part of your team? Hmm. Maybe these are sort of secondary ones. You said eventually this will go out to the public, eventually this will go out to researchers, et cetera. Yeah. You know, we have our three groups, which are the persons with burn injury, and they'll access that. In some ways, that will be the easier group to disseminate to because we're going to have them, they're going to access this directly through the Phoenix Society website. So they'll get, they'll take the Libre profile, they'll get their results, and there'll be recommendations on, you know, if they, if they show to be there in a sort of a lower um, rating that they could use some additional resources. So we're going to link them to resources there. It's the clinicians and researchers. Oh, researchers are even a little bit easier. Um, you know, research teams were developing a research version of the program and, you know, people can do local data storage on a laptop computer. But when you try to integrate this into a system of care, then we talk about um, getting this program embedded into a, an IT environment that we don't control. And these are some of the problems that we have. You know, let's say, um, actually right now, partners is is putting it into their IT environment. And obviously it requires expense on uh, partners' side in terms of 
paying for the IT support to do it. And, and it's not something that we can do um, in, a, in one stroke for every, every clinical site that wants to use it because the clinical sites we're finding um, you know, have issues around storing data like that on any place but their own clinical sites. So this is where so what we you're are. Bringing up, sorry to interrupt. What you're bringing up are really implementation issues and having yeah. to do with change and changing the, the situation really so that this gets integrated in the workflow. Um, and that's, it's, it's important and I can see where there's a lot of effort that's going to need to go there to reach your, your final destination of what you hope to accomplish. But if you sort of step back from that to what are the sorts of things you can do early on before you get into thinking about implementation and practice change. I mean, you did identify some other knowledge translation goals mm -hmm. which are more suited to this conversation just in terms of getting people to understand how do you build awareness and interest. And you've described a lot of the integrated way in which you've done that in the sense of identifying you know, who needs to be part of this and engaging them really early on, which is, as you pointed yeah. out, uh, a first step to, um, to getting to that behavior change and practice change. Um, can you think of um, some other strategies that have more to do with the, the yeah. building awareness, access, and, and yeah. opening the path to no. benefit? I think um, this is this is a good conversation to have. As you can see, I'm very focused on the technology and that implementation piece. But I think taking a step back and thinking about who will be the gateway to this um, instrument, and it will be clinicians. It will be clinicians who are seeing people with burn injury who will suggest that they go to the Phoenix Society website and, and look at this measure. It will be um, clinicians who are going to administer it and then uh, see the value in it, and um, so I, I do think this clinical network um, is critical, and, and we might want to do more knowledge translation among some of the specific groups like occupational therapists and physical therapists. Um, I think we've been very focused on burn injury, uh, like the American Burn Injury Association and the um, World Burn Conference, but uh, I think we do need to step back and target some of the disciplines that may not even be aware of this tool and uh, because they're not necessarily engaged as much in the burn community as they are in just more general practice, but will encounter the occasional person with burn injury. So yeah, I do think that's a gap. So there's some mm -hmm. level of penetration and reach that you want to accomplish in different kind of subgroups of yeah. Yeah, you know, we're preaching to the choir right now of people who are yeah. on board 100% because they're major burn centers. And um, for this to have greater pickup, I think we need to, um, I will go back and, and write up some approaches for engaging. I think OTs particularly um, will be working you know, closely with people with burn injury over the course of their recovery and through different surgeries. So. Uh, lots of opportunities to engage people who might have, we might have missed even people who have been out several years yeah. post-burn injury. And as yeah. you sort of work that, coming up with indicators, right? So how will you know that you accomplished that specific mm -hmm. goal? Um, oh, I, I think when we get, when we get beyond our, our we have a, a very tight group and as I said, they're very strong um, opinion leaders, but when we start to get requests and interest from people outside of our clinical advisory board and, and burn model systems people, um, then I think we'll know we've penetrated another target, uh, which is sort of uh, secondary users who would, would not be as um, knowledgeable about what we're doing. Yeah, I think we've, we've neglected that, um, that area. It's an opportunity to track those impacts and log them as you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and even even more qualitative things like sometimes impact can be a narrative. So you know, as you speak with either a different consumer group, patient group, 
outside of Phoenix or, um, as you mentioned, a practitioner group that perhaps isn't first, first string uh, in terms mm -hmm. of firm but would benefit is to document right. how that goes and maybe even capture uh, whether their knowledge shifts, their attitudes about, you know, whether this has pertinence and relevance to their own practice context mm -hmm. and whether it's and to do anything with the new knowledge that they've gained. Those kinds of things yeah. you can track. Yeah, I would, um, we could also, we're having a, a conference um, at the end of this and we can target some of these, uh, I wouldn't say our, our primary, more of our easy audiences, but our difficult, we'll, we'll target some of our difficult audiences and see how many of them have uh, expressed interest in learning about it. So. They won't be engaged in the very beginning beta test of our of our tools, but uh, in the uh, last several months of our project, we'll be doing widespread dissemination, and I will write up a um, plan for getting the other secondary users in there and see how effective we are at, at getting them engaged. Yeah, that's uh, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for sharing uh, your knowledge story. Um, the last little bit of time, we're going to turn this over to Margaret um, to um, have a, a similar go. Uh, Margaret, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I'm at the very beginning stage of planning the knowledge translation. Uh, we have just received a grant from the National Library of Medicine to create a website that will provide information to women with disabilities about pelvic and reproductive health. So our um, challenge for the next three years on that project is to create this website and make it usable for our intended audience, which is the women with um, primarily with physical disabilities or mobility impairment. <laughs> now, what I want to do, and this is where I'm, I'm really benefiting from um, your advice and listening uh, to you debrief the other ladies and also your uh, website that explains how to use this template uh, has been very informative about some of the huge gaps. I mean, we, we kind of jumped right into the, the establishing of this website, but what if we have a beautiful website up there with lots of information, and nobody can use it. You know, that, well, that's where I was going, Margaret. Um, I would back up, because there's a lot of times where we think, let's do a website, because it seems so self-evident. But remember that now you've jumped from a knowledge of what population you want to impact. You know the content of the knowledge you want to share, which is about um, reproductive health for that particular population, and you've jumped to a strategy right off the bat without really a knowledge translation goal. So back up a little and tell me, in the sharing of reproductive health information with this particular group of women, what, how do you hope that they will benefit? My goal is to activate women to be equal partners in their health care. So I, I'm, okay. hoping, I'm hoping that by providing information, I mean, this website we'll be constructing is only information. Um, the real question now is how will the women use it and how can we um, create information products that will be usable, uh, accessible, meaningful for them. Now, we do have uh, an advisory committee of 12 uh, women with disabilities uh, we'll be working with us on this for three years, and we also have physician advisors. We have six physicians who are working with us to make sure that our content is accurate from a medical practice point of view. And now, right. the, uh, what I hope to do is to write an application to Nidler to fund what you just said, going back a, a few steps and asking both parties both the physicians and the women, how do they, how can they use information uh, 
um, to achieve better outcomes in terms of reproductive health by working together. So keep in mind that a website is a channel of communication. It's not the content, right? And it probably makes sense given that you want to um, reach a broad spectrum of women geographically. It crosses geographic barriers. But in thinking about the KT goal, that's really going to direct your content. So if you want to activate women to become equal partners in their health care, that's knowledge-based, but it's also process-based, right? How do you use this knowledge, as you suggested a moment ago, how do you use this knowledge to be more of an advocate for yourself um, in terms of your reproductive health uh, as you navigate your world? Um, and so, you know, website is a channel, but the strategies that you're going to recommend to people um, will be within that website. It's just a vessel. So the, the challenge then is to create the combination of useful information and strategy advice. Yeah. And then to okay. assess that. Yeah. So, I mean, okay. in a way, you are, you, what's unique about your project, and we see this commonly, is that your project is really a, a knowledge translation project that you then also want to do some knowledge translation for. Kind of like the story within the story, if you will. Right, right. Right? Right. So, so that's, go ahead. I'm having trouble um, figuring out how to make this, um, how to put constraints on it, how to focus it. Um, I, I can think of ideas to address every single one of your um, 13 points here in preparing the planning doc document, but I, I, reminding myself, what is very, very limited, you know? I mean, I would love to do a study, I mean, a research study that looks at selected dyads of consumers and their physicians and, and follow them, um, work with them individually to help them access the information that we will have, and then see how, how it's useful for them and, and make it a kind of a, a reciprocity arrangement where they're informing us to change our, our information products so that they'll be more useful for them so that's, that's one point, is talking to them. The second point would be, how do we measure the uh, improved uh, engagement in their health care and how to look at um, shared decision making? I don't know if the instruments that are already out there would be applicable to this population. Um, and another question, entirely different, is how do you get the physicians to buy into this? I mean, they're a, a critical part of it. it. It's like, you know, a dog with two wings, one being the consumer and the other being the, the provider, and you can't get off the ground with only one of those. So how do we get the physicians who are, well, we all know what it's like to work with physicians. You know, it's difficult to fit into their schedule, for one. It's difficult to ask them to change their behavior. Um, and it's difficult to get them to engage in continuing education activities to improve the services that they give. I mean, I've got all kinds of documentation about how they're not meeting the needs of the women, and the women are not able to get what they want from their medical providers. So, you see, all these, all these different no. channels I have. Go ahead. So if I can just interject for a moment, a couple of thoughts. When you have a situation where your project, the, the, the substantive content of your project is knowledge translation, but you also want to translate that knowledge about your project, it's sort of two things happening on two different levels. And people often start to build what they think is their knowledge translation plan, but really they end up talking about their project methodology. So you need to take some time with your team to figure out What's the method for the project? And what's the method for how we translate 
what we learned from this project and the availability of this website to move into the sort of next project, which would be to evaluate how effective the website is in accomplishing our goals. So that's one thing to, to sort of unpack. The other thing is it sounds as though you've been funded by this grant to develop the website. I'm not sure you have the content of the website yet. So the other thing to unpack when you start with a website and a strategy and, and sort of all your eggs are in that basket is what's the technological bit about website development that you're going to be doing in your project? And then how are you developing the content for your website and what are the goals of the content? Um, the third point I want to make is there is new methodology coming out of uh, Canada right now uh, of, uh, called an information assessment method um, that um, is really an embedded survey at the bottom of a web page that allows the consumer, whoever is reading that web page, to click and answer about four or five very brief questions about whether they thought the information was useful, whether they intended to use it, um, whether they thought it was of high quality. And so then it becomes a methodology for evaluating the content you've put on your website uh, relative to the goals you're hoping to accomplish. So there might be some ways of crafting some questions um, as to um, how useful the information is although it probably won't get at evaluating whether the content you've shared via your website has actually empowered uh, women to advocate more on their behalf. So the complexities I'm trying to identify, and I'm mindful of the time, we're rolling up to two minutes before four here, are to sort of unpack what's project, what's KT plan, um, and because your project is both content and technology, unpacking that piece of your project. Does that make sense as a starting point? Yes, yes, it does. Tell me again the name of the tool that you've just developed. Um, I will uh, copy and paste it in the chat box. It's called the Information Assessment Method, um, and it was developed by an investigator uh, at McGill University in Montreal. Um, it's called the I am. I call it the I am. And the investigator is Pierre, which is uh, Peter in French, uh, Pui. And um, if you Google his name and the name of the measure, you'll find their website um, and more information about it. He's published on this. And it's a methodology where um, we've just begun to uh, experiment with and uh, about ad adopting for our own outward-facing uh, website that we have here at the Hospital for Sick Children called About Kids Health, which is our outward-facing educational website that is very informational as well, to try and do more than, to, it really allows you to get a little bit beyond the, the Google Analytics and the web analytics that give you information about penetration and spread and, and the demographics of your users to get at the more nitty-gritty things like did people like the content? Did they find it useful? Was it credible? Was it uh, rated as high quality? And so on. Um, and so that's, I'll put that information here. It's just, I just put it in the chat box. Okay. So uh, it's 4 o'clock, and uh, we certainly could have you know, spent two hours talking about all of these projects. I think with each case that we've discussed, there's been an opportunity to highlight a unique issue about knowledge translation planning. Um, and just in summary, moving backwards from Margaret through Mary and back um, to um, Wendy, I think you know the unpacking of what is KT versus what is project methodology is an important thing to consider for some projects. Um, and we got at that through Margaret. Um, I think with Mary, the tendency to jump straight to implementation before you really think through your other knowledge translation goals, which prepare the stage in many ways for effectiveness and implementation. Um, so I try not I try to separate that out because this is a, a knowledge translation template, not an implementation planning template. Two different things, although related. 
Um, and then I think what we saw with Wendy was, um, oh, now I'm stretching to, to think right back, but, um, you know, being um, the importance of integrating your knowledge users right at the beginning, which both Mary and Wendy have done uh, because of the nature of their projects. Um, and, um, you know, thinking through, again, I think is an example of separating out your research methodology from your KT methodology or your project methodology from your KT methodology, recognizing that not, not everything is research-based. Um, so I hope that was useful for everybody. Joanne, I'm going to send it back to you. Well, thank, <coughs> thank you very much, Melanie. I think it was very interesting. And <coughs> I think we were probably all surprised to see that an hour had already passed so quickly. I know I was for sure, but I want to thank you for taking time to be with us today and a special thanks to Wendy, to Mary, and to Peg for their participation and sharing their activities. I also want to thank the other KTDR staff members who helped in planning and especially Stephen Boydston for providing valuable technical support. And we also want to express our gratitude to Nidler for supporting the activities of the Center on KTDRR. I want to encourage everyone to fill out the brief evaluation form, um, hoping that it may pop up here so that you'll be able to go to it uh, directly. But if not, we'll be following up this event with an email that contains a link to the evaluation. And we'll also let you know when the archived uh, recording is available with a written transcript. And they'll be posted on the original webcast information page. We did have a couple of questions we weren't able to get to. We might. Uh, pass those on to Melanie and see if she has any responses for us. And if that is the case, we'll go ahead and send that to uh, people who registered and filled out the evaluation.